Well, if you would like to take your Bibles, we're going to look at God's truth right now, and we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6. Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 6. Well, what document was signed this coming week, long ago, that changed history here? The Declaration of Independence. Yeah, the 13 British colonies uh, were planted by England. Over time, they felt mistreated. They appealed to the king and to parliament over and over and over again for many, many years. Uh, They pretty much just got ignored, and England continued to mistreat and mistreat uh, the colonies and, and then eventually take away rights, and it got worse and worse and worse until finally the colonies said enough. We're done being mistreated. We are now making a declaration to the world. We are no longer 13 British colonies. We are the United States of America. And they signed and published the Declaration of Independence. It struck me the other day that that act of declaring yourself uh, independent is the exact opposite of what it means to become a Christian. We start off life declaring our independence to God. You know, uh, I'm going to live my own life. I'm going to do my own thing. No one's going to tell me what to do. That's in the heart of every toddler. That's in the heart of every teenager, every adult, every senior citizen. As we go through this life, it's this, the curse of sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve that we are going our direction. We're not interested in seeking God to rule our lives. By nature, we are seeking to rule our own lives. Until One day, we hear God call out to us. And God calls out to us through creation, displaying his divinity and sovereignty and power. God calls out through his law written on each one of our hearts, teaching us his standards and his perfection and our guiltiness. God calls out to us through his word. He calls out to us through his spirit to convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. All of those things saying, come to me. Come to me. God calling to all of us. And when we, by faith, say, yes, I will listen to all this truth that's come to me from all these different ways, I will accept by faith Christ as my king who who came to save my life. That act is the act of lowering your flag of independence and declaring a declaration of dependence upon God. I am dependent upon you now. I cannot make it through life without you. I will die and go to hell should I stand in judgment. I need you. That is the the core of what it means to become a Christian, declaring your dependence upon God. But that doesn't just stop the day you decided to accept Christ. The central part of living the Christian life is daily declaring our dependence upon God. So it starts with a declaration, and then God wants us daily declaring our uh, dependence upon him. Do you do that? Every day, do you declare your dependence upon God? God says there's incredibly uh, great consequences if we don't do that. He says we will experience a lot of hardships and troubles in life if we don't declare our dependence upon God every day, which means you could be here today and you have a real trial going on in your life, it very well could possibly go back to uh, you're not going to God every day and declaring your dependence upon him. That's possible. That's what we're going to look at today. This weekend before the 4th of July, we're looking at the subject of the importance of daily declaring our dependence upon God. God tells us, that we're supposed to do this. In one of the most well-known passages in all of the Bible, a passage you know and can probably quote right now. And as I said, the consequences of not doing this are severe. It can really mess up our lives, so we need to make sure we're doing this. Let's listen up carefully as we look at the importance of daily declaring our dependence upon God. Look with me at the well-known verses, Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or honored be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Billions and billions of people around this world know this prayer, and probably most of them can quote it by heart. It will be prayed probably billions of times today. Uh, It's probably one of the first things we teach our children in Sunday school, right? We teach them the Lord's Prayer. The problem with all of that is that we can view this as basic Christianity that we kind of leave behind as we mature. Yeah, the Lord's Prayer, yeah, yeah, we learned that in Sunday school, but yeah, let's go on to deeper, meatier things. Can we treat it like that? Absolutely, absolutely not. I couldn't say it in stronger words. This simple prayer, it's 55 words, takes 20 seconds to pray. It contains the core teachings on how to live life successfully. This isn't just basic stuff. This is core stuff. Understanding the teachings in this verse makes the difference between living life with your eyes wide open in the truth or living life deceived and in the dark, and you just won't make it. It's all contained in this prayer. You may know that this prayer is cleanly divided into two parts. Uh, Three requests at the beginning, three requests at the end. The first three requests are all focused on God. God, let your name be hallowed or honored. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And then the last half is three prayers for ourselves. Give us our daily bread, forgive us our debts, and deliver us from evil. We are going to look at that last half today. What are those three requests saying? Give us, forgive us, deliver us. Those are declarations of dependence. God, we need you. We need you to give us food. We need you to forgive us of our sins. We need you to deliver us from evil. We declare our dependence upon you. That's what I'm talking about when I say we need to do this. If we don't do it, we risk great trouble in our lives because we're not declaring our dependence upon God. What Jesus is giving here is an outline on how to pray. The disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so he gave them this outline. It wasn't meant to be prayed, you know, this is what you must say every single day. That's not what Jesus intended. He intended to be a skeleton outline for us then to hang all the other things that we want to pray about. You can pray this word for word, but he intended it to basically give the concept of what it's all about. Number one, when you pray, start off focused on God's welfare and pray for his success in the world. But then number two, bring your own requests Because you are really needy. So pray for your welfare, pray for your forgiveness, and pray for your protection. That's what he has to say here. Note, particularly in the words of verse 11, it twice says daily. It says, give us this day our daily bread. God doesn't want this. He could have said, look, I want you to pray. Give us this month the daily bread that we'll need. That'll be much more efficient. You just pray it at the beginning of every month, and then it'll take care of all the weeks of, you know, of the month. Wouldn't that be easier? Or give us this week our daily bread. No, it says give us this day our daily bread. So how often do, are we supposed to be doing this? Every day. Every day, God wants us going to him and saying, today, give me the bread I need. Now, this word bread doesn't necessarily literally mean bread. Bread in those days could be used for all of life's necessities. Bread was a necessity of life. You could, you'd be praying the same thing if you say, Lord, give us this day our daily needs. All the needs we have today. The need for food. The need for health. The need for wisdom. The need for strength and energy. Give us the basic necessities of life today. We need them. And again, today. God intended that this be done daily daily declaring our dependence upon him. So central to becoming a Christian is the declaration of dependence. I need you or I'm going to hell. And then central to living the Christian life is daily declaring your dependence upon God. I need you. I declare my dependence upon you this morning as I get up and go into the world. Now, although billions of people are probably going to pray this this day, around the world. We all know it can be prayed, just rattle it off. Not much engaged. You know, see how fast we can get through it and we'll get on to the other things in life. And totally miss the truths that are contained in this prayer. That's what we want to look at 
for the rest of the sermon here. Three truths about ourselves that are contained in this prayer. Three truths about ourselves. They're crucial truths, and they're absolutely basic truths. None of these will surprise you. But the ironic part is, though, everybody would say, yeah, we know that. Very often they're forgotten and neglected and, and, at, and at great cost to us. We're going to look at the three truths that the Lord's Prayer here tells us about ourselves. Number one, the first of the three truths uh, is, is found there in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. The first truth there in your insert is number one, I am needy. I am needy. Everyone say with me, I am needy. Once again, I am needy. How does that feel? You know, you might be going through a lot of problems right now, and you say, yeah, I am needy. But most people that I know would say, yeah, I don't like saying that. That kind of sticks in my throat. I'm not needy. I have what it takes. I can do it. I can live life. I don't need any help. Really? Because that's not what God says. God says you're needy. Um, what would you say to a patient in the intensive care unit? And you walk into the room, and they're pulling out all the tubes and hoses that are attached to their body and, and trying to get out of the room. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. You've got to stop this. You are not ready for this. You're not up to going out there. You are really needy. That's exactly what God says to us as he looks down on earth. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you guys need to come to me every day because you're really needy. You don't have what it takes to live life without me. And that's the second point of your insert there. I am needy because I don't have what it takes to live apart from Christ. In your insert, I am needy because I don't have what it takes to live apart from Christ. Um, look at and remember John fifteen five. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do a lot of things, but not everything. We live that way. I can handle my own life, but when, it gets, when I get in trouble, I'll go to prayer. God says, don't do that. You're like that intensive care person. You don't have what it takes to live apart from me. You need to start your day, not just when things go wrong, praying for me. You need to start your day praying for me. God, I need you. I'm really needy. I don't have what it takes to live life apart from you. Um, yeah, that's what Jesus says. Jesus says, you must grasp this basic truth. So I'm going to put it in the, you know, the most basic terms I can. You are needy and you can't live life apart from me. That's what he says. Is this really basic truth? Absolutely. Is this truth that's easily forgotten? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a light bulb can brag about how bright it is and how it doesn't need anybody. It can do all these things on its own, but it can't do anything without being plugged into a socket. can't do anything. It's absolutely dependent upon that socket. And we can do the same thing. We can brag about how many things we can accomplish, what we're going to do, where we're going to go, how we're going to do it, and all the things I've done in my life. God says, yeah, but you can't do it without me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm the socket. You're the light bulb. And yes, you're made in the image of God. And yes, you are special and talented and, and you know, a wonderful thing that God has created. But you were meant to live in close relationship with him. Him supplying you with the things that you don't have to, to take to, to, to live life successfully on your own. And you might say, well, that's <clears throat> really a rather um, terrible view of myself, right? You don't have to hang your head with shame saying, I can't live life without Christ. That's the way you were designed. In fact, it's the shameful part is to say, I can live my life without Christ and not go to him for help. That's the shameful thing. Number one, are you, first of all, believing that you are needy and you can live, do nothing apart from Christ? Do you actually believe that about yourself? Probably when... We talk about it here, you'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you remember that, like on a Thursday afternoon? We tend to forget this. We need to believe we are needy and can't do anything without Christ. Not anything that lasts. We can do a bunch of stuff, but not stuff that's going to last through eternity. Number two, are you praying that God meet your needs? Because that's what he's saying here. He says, I want you to come to me and pray 
that I meet your daily needs. You're needy, start praying that I provide for you every day. Don't skip it. You might say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. If I have food in my cupboard, do I need to pray this? If I've got, you know, some money saved in the, in, in the bank, if I have, a, you know, a good health care plan and everything's, you know, I've, I've prepared all these different things, do I still need to pray, give me my daily needs if my daily needs are right there in front of me? King David, when he was at the height of his power, had huge armies and chariots and horses and all sorts of things uh, that made him powerful. He had prepared and planned as a responsible king does and gotten all these things. But then he reminded himself of the truth in Psalm thirty-three, sixteen. He says, No king is saved by the size of his army, and no warrior escapes by his great strength, and a horse is an empty hope for deliverance. We hope in the Lord. He is our strength and our shield. We need to ask God's provision each day. Because we can't count on our own provision to be our hope. Yes, the responsible thing for a king to do is to get chariots and get horses and get soldiers. That's the responsible thing to do. But then this says don't rely on them as your hope. You're doing the wise thing. But your safety and security doesn't lie in your preparation. It lies in God who is your hope and your shield. In other words, you as a king can have no army, no chariots, remember Gideon, and you can still win the battle because the Lord is your hope and your shield. You prepare to be wise. You don't prepare to be safe. And the God would say the same thing to you and me. Yes, uh, responsibly, you know, put away food. You don't know if there's going to be a blizzard or something or, you know, economic problems. Put away food. Get the best health care you can. Uh, uh, save as much responsibly as you can. Those are the responsible, wise things to do as you see need approaching. But then all this preparation, don't trust in it. Prepare, but don't trust in it. You prepare to be wise. You don't prepare to be safe. Your safety is in God, who loves you. So all your health care can leave. You can have a terminal illness. You can go bankrupt, have no money left. Uh, Everything go wrong, and you're still safe in God's hands. He's going to take care of you. You might lead you through some really hard things, but you're going to get to the other side in the end, and you're in victory. So the answer is yes. Even if you have a cupboard full of food, still pray for God to provide your daily needs. But I can see it, yes, but that isn't what keeps you safe. He is what keeps you safe. Still pray. You are never stronger when you admit that you are needy and go to God for provision. Right? You are never stronger when you admit you're needy and go to God for provision. Truth number one about ourselves. I am needy, and I don't have what it takes to live apart from Christ. You must remember that. Number two. Truth number two is found in verse 12. Forgive us our debts. Truth number two is, I am flawed. Flawed. Everyone say with me, I am flawed. Does that stick in your throat? Probably shouldn't surprise you, but we forget that one too. You know, my opinion's right, my ways are right, my choices are right, you know, and God says, uh... <laughs> you hear people say, yeah, you're supposed to go into the mirror and look at yourself every morning and saying, I am beautiful, I am powerful, I am talented, I am incredible. All I need to do is bloom into the wonderful person that I already am. Ugh, that probably makes God want to throw up. <laughs> you're flawed, okay? Yes, you're a special creation of God made in his image, but you're not perfected yet. Okay, you are flawed. And you must have that be a key understanding of yourself as you head out into the world. You are flawed. Um, what would you say to the beginner piano student who has a big competition that the teacher has entered him in and there's this really well-known, very strict judge who's going to be there? The teacher would say to the beginner piano student, look, you know, get out there, do your best. You've learned a lot, but you're not going to be perfect. You know, expect flaws. That's what God says to you and me. 
If you've committed yourself to Christ, he's given you a new heart and a new life and a new relationship with him, but you're not perfected yet. Go out there, do your best, live for him, but you're flawed. And that's in your insert. The second truth about ourselves is I'm flawed because I am not perfected yet. You know that. Basic truth. You are not perfected yet, but we tend to forget that. It says, forgive us our debts. What is the debt that we owe God? What is the debt that you owe God? The wages of sin is death. Yeah, that's the debt that we go owe God. There's only two types of people in this entire world. There's those who have committed themselves to Christ and have their debt paid, and those who have not con- committed themselves to Christ and still owe that debt and will pay that debt once they pass out of this life. Only two types of people. If you are committed to Jesus Christ today, he has paid your debt in full. So do you need to ask him to forgive you of your sins? What does the Lord's Prayer say? The Lord says, yeah, forgive us of our debts. But the thing is, you're not asking forgiveness from God as your judge, but God as your father. Okay? Any father who his child says, I'm not going to do what you want me to do, you know, hey, you know, put your toy on the table, and they take the toy and they throw it across the room. Okay, we got a problem here. What's that going to do? Is the father going to kick the, the kid out of the house and disown him? No. Uh, what the father is going to do, though, is going to disrupt the harmony of their relationship. The, the, the child has just disrupted the harmony. The harmony is not there. The peace between the father and the child is not there. When does it get resolved? When the child apologizes, confesses their sin, says, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, and then it's healed. That is the type of confession of sin that we need to do. God is judge. God is our judge. That's completely taken care of the moment you put faith in Jesus Christ. That debt is paid, gone. You never have to worry about God as judge. God is father. Yes, God is father. You need to ask forgiveness to heal that broken relationship. You cannot afford to have a broken relationship with God as father because what does a good father do when the child disobeys? He disciplines them. And you will have to live with unnecessary discipline and problems and trials and struggles in life as long as you have unrepentant sin in your life. So this is what Jesus is saying. Forgive us our debts. Why do we need to do that if I'm already forgiven and going to heaven? Because that daily relationship needs to be restored as you fail and you need to restore it. How often do you need to confess your sins? How often do you need to confess your sins? Well, you know that you're an imperfect person who is flawed. You're not perfected yet. So how often do you think you fail to hit the center of God's target every day? Probably, probably every day, right? And I think that's this idea of daily bread flows down into daily forgiveness as well. Absolutely. Uh, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5. I have a clear conscience, but that doesn't mean I have God's approval. It is the Lord who cross-examines me. What is the aim of the beginner piano student? To go out there and do, be, to be perfect, right? The piano student doesn't go out there and say, yeah, I'll, I'll slop around on the piano and then come back. No, you go out there with the aim to be perfect. And what does God say is our aim as Christians, living the Christian life, we're to go out and live life aiming to be perfect every day. Not having a low standard, but a high standard. Paul calls it keeping a clear conscience. He says that was his standard for how he talked, how he made choices, how he interacted with problem people about the goals he set. I want everything I do to have a clear conscience before God. That was his high, high aim. It wasn't 90% obedience. It was 100% obedience. That's what Paul aimed at. Are you aiming at 100% obedience every day? You might say, Pastor, I can't do that. You just said I'm not perfected yet. No, you cannot achieve 100% obedience. But you can aim, every one of us can aim at 100% of obedience, just like that beginner piano student. He's not going to make it, but he needs to aim there. Are you aiming at 100% obedience in what you say and what you do and how you think during your day? That's God's standard for you. His standard is having a clear conscience. So that means when you speak to someone, 
and a twinge goes off in your conscience, maybe I shouldn't have done that. That was not a nice thing to say. That was probably too harsh. That was not a good word. You've just broken a clear conscience, and you need to confess that as sin. If you're watching something on the Internet and your conscience goes, uh, that's not good. If you're listening to a song and the words are like, eh, that's not good. If you, you know, what are the thousands of other things we can do? When your conscience says that's not good, you need to listen up. Because that means you're breaking your conscience if you continue in that. You want to you just slam the door when that happens. If you keep that door open, then God says, uh, you've just sinned. Now, other people may be able to do these things. I don't have a problem with that. But if you have a problem with it, God says, you cannot continue in that thing. As long as you do not have a clear conscience about it, you cannot continue in it. Why? Because we have one major goal in this life. All of life boils under one thing. 1 John 3.22 We obey his commandments and do what pleases him. That is our goal in this world, to please Jesus Christ. You are not going to stand before your boss at the end of this life and have to give an account to him. You're not going to stand before your spouse. You're not going to stand your parents or your kids or your next door neighbor or anyone here at church. You're standing before one person, Jesus Christ, and you need to make sure that what you're doing today is going to please him in that day. That's the goal of life. That's what it's all about. If you please Jesus, you have done everything you need to do, even if it displeases everybody else. As long as you're pleasing Jesus, you've done what you need to do. The truth is, though, if you are committed to pleasing Jesus... That means he is first place in your life and other people are more important than yourself. You love them as yourself. So if your goal is to please Jesus, you are most likely going to end up pleasing your boss and your spouse and your children and your parents because you're living in a godly way. But sometimes you still don't please everybody and that's okay. You're not called to please everybody. You're called to please one person. You have one master. You have one king. Make sure you're pleasing him. And when your conscience says, I don't know if this is something he'd like, then you better stop. Put the brakes on it. Other people might say, I can do that. Fine. I'm not, you know, I don't have to answer to you. I have to answer to him, and I'm not sure he's pleased with this. Then put on the brakes. Do what is pleasing in his sight. So you aim to have a clear conscience every day. When that conscience is broken, confess your sins. Go to God. I'm imperfect, I fail, uh, I need your forgiveness. What about you get to the end of the day and you think back and you say, I don't have a broken conscience about anything that I did today. You know what the answer is? You still confess your sins. Yeah, listen to Psalm 19.12. Who can notice his every mistake? Answer, nobody. Forgive my hidden faults. That is, the faults hidden from me. The ones I didn't notice. So here, what this writer is saying, if at the end of the day you get and you say, hey, I have a clear conscience about what I said and what I did, what I planned, how I thought, still confess your sins anyway because you don't know what hidden faults you did that offended God that you weren't even aware of. Thoughts, motives, you don't have a clue in, clue with. Because remember, it said Christ is the one who cross-examines you. When you cross-examine yourself, you say, yep, I did great. But you're not the judge. He's the judge. He cross-examines you. And if you sense, I mean, rather, if you don't even sense you're wrong, still say, if I offended you today by doing something I shouldn't have done, not doing something I should have done, please forgive me. Because what? What's the truth? I am flawed and not perfected yet. So even though I'm not aware of it, I will, con- I will c- confess any sins that I did that offended God. If you are not doing that, your broken closeness with God is going to cost you. Because what does God do? If you are not going every day and say, please forgive me for the things I know about, let alone things I don't know about, God is going to bring troubles into your life, spankings from a loving father to get your attention, and you will be harassed with problems that you wouldn't have if you went to him every day and asked for forgiveness of sins. Maybe today, right now, you are struggling with something in your life. God doesn't want to be there, but because you haven't gone and fixed your 
broken relationship with him that he's having to bring this into your life. Uh, first thing I do is when you get an opportunity, go and say, Lord, I need to confess this. I, I did it, and I never took responsibility for it. Make sure you heal that relationship. He wants you to do that. The second truth is that you are imperfect and must daily pray for God's forgiveness to keep a close relationship with him. The third truth is found in verse 13, which says, Deliver us from evil, or it can be translated, the evil one, Satan himself. The third truth is, in your inserts, I am vulnerable. I am vulnerable. Everyone say, I am vulnerable. Do you feel vulnerable? That's probably one that's probably of the three the easiest, because you can't walk around in this world, this dark, dark world, and, and not feel vulnerable. Uh, you are, it seems like the government's out against us in so many ways. Certainly Satan and his demons are out against us. People are out against us. Circumstances. We feel vulnerable a lot of the time. Um, what would you tell a soldier who's in his barracks and he's about to head out into the battlefield and you know, everybody knows there's like five times the strength of the enemy than what our side has. What would you tell that soldier? It's what God is telling you and me. But it's far more than five times. He says, you're vulnerable because you are outmatched by your enemy. And that's in your insert. I, I am vulnerable because I am outmatched against my enemy. That's what God tells us. That's the truth. And we cannot forget that. We don't see demons, but they're there. And they attack and they plot and they scheme and they try to bring evil and harm and trouble and all sorts of, of uh, unbelief and grief into our lives. We are outmatched. They have thousands of years of history of defeating Christians. And if we're not heads up to that, we will be defeated and taken down and miserable and have problems and troubles and evil come into our lives. We are very, very vulnerable. And that could leave you in panic and worry and, and fretting and, and wringing your hands. Except that what does God tell us to do? Pray for my protection, deliverance from evil. See, you are outmatched, but Jesus isn't outmatched. Jesus created these beings. He has complete control over them, and he will control them in your life, but you've got to go to him and ask for the protection. What if you don't go and pray for protection from evil? Will life be okay anyway? It doesn't make sense, does it? He tells us to pray for it because it needs to be activated. If it comes anyway, then why tell us to pray for it? God is telling us you need to activate this by praying for it in order to have his protection. How often would you need to do that? Well, you can wait until you feel threatened by trouble, evil, harm, and problems. And that's what we most often do. We're just going, kind of going along and then something bad happens and we pray. God says, don't do that. Start your day praying for protection. Cover that day with protection before a problem begins. And what do you think? How many times do you think you prayed, activated God's protection, and then escaped problems, troubles, hardships, and trials? There's probably too many to count because you activated it ahead of time. On the other, on the other hand, how many times did you not pray, not activate it, and had problems, troubles, heartaches, sorrows, doubts, problems in your life? probably more times than we can count. What does God want us to do? God is teaching us the truth about ourselves. He says, you're vulnerable and you're outmatched, but here I am. So come to me every day and pray for deliverance from evil and the evil one. Right, number one, are you believe that you're vulnerable and outmatched? Do you really believe that? Satan works hard to make sure, you know, nah, demons don't exist. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. That was Old Testament, Bible days. Number one, do you believe that? Number two, are you daily going to God and asking him to protect you? You need to do that. Parents, do it for your kids. Kids, do it for your parents. Let's all do it for each other. We're all in a war. We need to do this. In all of these three requests that are part of this 
prayer God gives us, Satan works hard to tell us a lie. And you've heard this lie many, many times in your head. The lie is, hey, you can skip prayer today. It'll be fine. You know, you, you hit the floor. You've got all these things to do. You're swamped. by. You're running behind. I'm skipping prayer. I'm just going. Or you wake up and you feel miserable. And you're tired and you're exhausted. You say, I'm just skipping prayer today. I don't feel like it. Satan says, good. Because you're not activating God's power. Satan wants you to feel you can skip prayer and be just fine. And what does that reveal about what we believe about ourselves when we easily skip prayer? We don't believe these truths. We don't believe we're needy. We don't believe we're flawed, really. We don't believe that we need God's protection, that we face it, a threat and are vulnerable. But really, if we can easily skip prayers, it means we, really, we might know these truths, but we don't really believe them about ourselves. We've got to be serious about this. You will not make it through this life successively if you don't believe and activate these truths in your life on a daily basis. Not praying for God's provision and forgiveness and protection is going to cost you. Okay. Not praying for his provision means you're going to have needs in your life that wouldn't be there otherwise. Not praying for his forgiveness means you're going to be having hardship of discipline in your life that wouldn't be there otherwise. Not praying for his protection means you're going to be beat up and hurt and suffer problems in your life that wouldn't be there if you prayed otherwise. So God says pray. Daily pray these things. And you might say, well, yeah, but... That image is such a pathetic view of me. You know, here I am, I'm needy, and I'm flawed, and I'm vulnerable. What a pathetic view of myself. But what does Jesus say? My power is perfected in weakness. When you admit, when you own to your own weakness, man, you couldn't be more powerful as then you turn to Christ. A lot of people own their own weakness and then, you know, walk around in misery instead of turning to Christ. That's not what Christ does to do. Admit your own weakness and then turn to me and then gain my provision, my forgiveness, and my protection in your life. And you are, you're never more powerful when you own your own weakness and substitute my strength for your weakness. So it's not a pathetic view. It's, it's the truth is marching on view about yourself. That's the truth. Own it and turn to God to supply what you lack. That's what this is teaching. So the Lord's Prayer is basic Christianity, but it's not something that you get to mature out of and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I learned that long ago, but you know, I'm, I'm way over here now. These are core truths for how to live life in truth versus deception. If you don't believe these three truths about yourself, you're living in deception, you cannot live life successfully, you will be crippled as you try to live your Christian life. And so that's why he puts it in, in, in this prayer. Fifty-five words, 20 seconds long, contain the core teachings of how to live life successfully. And it's all about your view of yourself. Make sure you, number one, are believing these truths about yourself. Your homework this week is to go home and tell yourself, as you get up in the morning, oh, I'm needy, I am flawed, and I am vulnerable today. And then do that tomorrow, and do it the next day, and the next, and for the rest of your life. I am needy, flawed, and vulnerable. But right now, I'm going to God to pray for his provision, for his forgiveness, and for his protection. And now I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's God's plan. Make sure you're doing that. That's, that's my intention for the rest of my life, to remind myself of these truths, and to make sure that I'm accessing his strength. Please do that as well. Your life, will, your life will be on the track of success if you start each day that way.